Climb into the cockpit with pilot and Wing Square's Chief Legal Officer, Tim Perilla, as he invites legal leaders aboard to share advice that will help you navigate even the most turbulent times of in-house counsel work. We'll cover a range of topics from data privacy to legal team structure to public company transactions and beyond. You don't want to miss this series. Fasten your seatbelt and prepare for takeoff. You're listening to Cockpit Council. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Cockpit Council. My name is Tim. I'm the Chief Legal Officer at Link Squares. And as always, we have a producer, Alyssa Verzino. How's it going, Alyssa? Doing well. How are you? Good, good. And joining us today is Albert Towell. So Albert is former big law lawyer uh, turned entrepreneur and founder. So uh, welcome to the show, Albert. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is, this is really exciting. So uh, let's let's kick it off. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. So um, a bit about me, I, uh, I guess, personal bio a little bit. I went to Boston University for undergrad. Uh, that was that was great. Uh, while I was there, towards the end of my time there, starting when I was about to start law school, I uh, worked on a couple of small businesses. Um, one was a t-shirt business where we actually sell, sold t-shirts to sororities and fraternities on campus and, and some other places around the country, which was fun. Uh, and then the other, while I was in finishing up college and starting law school, was a, a delivery business for, for groceries, like basically from Costco. And this was the days before Instacart. People wanted food, you know, stuff delivered, but the grocery delivery companies weren't really blooming yet. And people love Costco, but they just don't want to go there and pick up all the stuff themselves and schlep it home. So uh, we live in a, in a pretty popular summer town, and uh, especially people who are in town for the summer, uh, we did we were pretty popular and, and built a pretty nice business doing that um, before before grocery delivery became mainstream. Uh, so it's kind of a, a fun fact about me personally. I, I live in New Jersey right now uh, with my wife and, and two kids. Um, t- happy to chat about my career path as well. Uh, graduated yeah. from, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, so how, how old are your kids? I have a uh, daughter who's about to turn four and a son who is about a year and a half. Oh, nice. Sounds like you're uh, sounds like you're probably bored with a lot of downtime, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, nothing to do. Uh, no responsibilities. Uh, so it's yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. So, uh, yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about your career path and and uh, and, you know, your decision to go to law school and and what you did after. Yeah, when I was in when I was in college, I, I uh, you know explored a, a couple of different career paths. One of them was accounting. I thought maybe that'd be interesting, but I, law was always in the back of my mind. And then I realized, kind of midway through college, that I would probably enjoy a career in law for a few different reasons, um, and uh, decided to go to law school. So took the LSAT, applied to law school, and, and went uh, went straight through. So I started NYU in 2014, graduated in in 2017. Um, and uh, enjoyed law school a lot. Uh, once I graduated, I joined uh, Cleary Gottlieb uh, in New York, and then I also worked after that at Fenwick and West uh, in New York, and uh, going to West Coast firm, but in their New York office. Um, and my specialty was I did transactional intellectual property, so trans- transactional IP work, or sometimes called te- technology transactions. Uh, so that's that's what I did. And then in in 2022, uh, I left my job as an associate to to start uh, Lateral Hub, and, and here we are two years later. Nice. Very cool. How uh, how do you think Big Law helped set you up for for now running your own legal tech company? Yeah, it's uh, I think a few different a few different ways. I mean, um, I mean, generally, as a as a lawyer, I think it is pretty different. Uh, you know, lawyers usually and they kind of known for this, put a lot of emphasis on attention to detail and getting things perfect. And that is a, obviously a good trait, uh, but it can be counterproductive to a founder if there's too much emphasis on perfection, you know, over speed and quality. So I think part of that is, is moving away from that mindset. But I was fortunate as a, as a tech transactions lawyer, I worked a lot with startup clients uh, and I had a nice perspective with that in that industry, even as a lawyer. So for many of those clients, they were, you know, they didn't have the leverage or the desire to pick apart a contract and focus on details that were never going to come up. Um, some of them were signing on their first customer, and we had to help them think through. Okay, what are the th- what are the things that are absolutely critical uh, for this for this arrangement? And we had to be nimble in our approach and be creative in how we mark up the agreement or how we negotiate to make sure we protected our client, but still realized that the business considerations here were critical. Um, so I, I use that approach for Lateral Hub and I focus, you know, the legal side, I'm a lawyer, so obviously I focus on the legal side of things, but I, I think I have a good view of how that fits within the broader business goals versus just focusing on on the legal, you know, obviously all of our legal stuff is buttoned up. I wouldn't have it any other way, but sure. uh, it's important to look at it from a kind of a 10,000 foot view and understanding like how this fits in generally. How many, how many folks do you have with you there at uh, Lateral Hub? 
we are we are a small a small but mighty team. Uh, it's it's three of us, um, and uh, we we do a lot with a little. So it's uh, it's a small team is a fast team, as they say. So we work quickly. Nice. And how did you meet your co-founders? So it's actually I I, I founded it myself. Uh, a couple team members joined afterwards. Uh, we have one we have one team member who is uh, who works overseas as kind of our operations guru. So a lot of the the day to day and stuff that happens behind the scenes, he he's done a really good job of of managing all of that. Uh, his name is Brad, and he's great. Um, and then actually my uh, my current colleague in in, in the U.S. Um, it's really a great story how we met. Um, she actually was the her name is Katie. She was a recruiting director at um, at a large law firm. And in 2022, when I was kind of pitching the lateral hub concept to firms to sign up for our launch, she was one of the people that answered my cold email and uh, gave her a demo of uh, of the platform. And she said, you know, this is something I've been thinking about for a long time. This is fantastic. I love this idea. I'm actually about to leave my job to go to uh, to go work at a tech company in their legal operations department. But stay in touch with me. And, you know, I, I do coaching on the side. Just stay in touch. So we stayed in touch. And we would, you know, message on LinkedIn here and there. And then when we launched a separate part of our business, Summer Associate Hub, which I'm sure we'll talk about, she actually reached out to me a year later and said, hey, um, I love what you're doing. I'm actually leaving my job. And if you're looking to hire somebody, please keep me in mind. And I said, well, we weren't looking until now. <laughs> right. And uh, we figured out we figured out a way to make it work. And she's kind of the missing piece because I have the experience as as an associate, as a law student. And she has the experience uh, with the hat of of somebody who'd be buying our product as a law firm recruiting, you know, director of recruiting, um, and, and what it's like to hire, to hire lawyers. So, um, that's, that's really great. And I'm very lucky to have her. That's awesome. I love how it all started from a cold email too. Yeah. <laughs> you never know who you meet, who you're going to meet and what it's going to turn into. So. Yeah, ex exactly. It's, uh, it's, it's one of those, one of those like classic serendipitous stories, right? Where you just pounding pavement, sending cold emails and all it takes is one. All it takes is one for for a major shift in the trajectory of what you're doing to occur. Yeah. So um, let's let's backpedal a little bit. Let's go. Uh, let's let's talk about your time at uh, at the law firms. Um, you know what what was it there uh, that made you that made you not want to be a part of Big Law anymore? <laughs> I actually would say I actually would say. Uh... I, I'll flip the question on you if that's okay. I'll actually yeah, say sure. it's what made, what made me want to start Lateral Hub because I think some people assume that I you know, kind of escaped big law or, or didn't like it or I was disgruntled. I actually most you know, generally enjoyed my time as an associate. Um, kind of the only reason I left was because I had this idea. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs have this experience where you have a good idea, you did the research, you have an outline in your head, and it got to a point where – I actually remember sitting at my desk in the fall of 2022 and I was trying to write an, like a long, I had to write an email to about it or something to a client or to a partner or something. And I remember sitting at my desk and the email took me an hour because all I could think about was lateral <laughs> hub. And that's when I realized it's either I do it or I just think about doing it my whole life. Um, right. So uh, I decided to do it. And um, so I wasn't particularly unhappy as a lawyer. I just uh, had this idea and I told myself if, if I'm going to do it, now's the time. And how did, how Again, I like. I'm always interested in. So I, I've never been a part of a law firm, uh, which is uh, fortunate, and you know, uh, at least in some ways, it's fortunate. But um, what was the what was the initial training like? The initial training? Yeah, like how did you get into tech transactions, and you know, unless maybe that was something that was an interest for you, like coming out of school. But most of the folks I graduated with were interested in whatever people would pay them to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think it was, it's, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, I generally got, I think it's just really about talking to people. Um, you talk to, when you're a law student, we, we give this advice a lot to law students on our platform. Um, you know, the best way to figure out what you want to do is to talk to people, uh, talk to lawyers, hear from them. Um, so I would speak to different people through the interview process, through networking. And I definitely, uh, realized that I wanted to do transactional work. Um, I just didn't know what type. So as a summer associate and speaking with attorneys, I tried to really hone in on what I wanted to do. And one of the one of the transactional IP partners kind of convinced me like this is if you're entrepreneurial, if you get excited about understanding somebody's business or understanding somebody's technology, this is a field for you because um, we're obviously doing legal work. But part of the work is understanding at a deep level what their technology is like. Uh, and that appealed to me that that was exciting to me. And that's why I chose that's why I chose that field. Uh, and and definitely, I definitely, definitely made the right choice because it was a, it was an area that that I really enjoyed. Yeah, tech transactions are fun. Um, most of 
most of the early work in my career was around like various like softer IP transactions um, and you know everything from brand licensing to platform licensing and things like that. It's um, it's a really good way to to really understand the business that you're a part of or that you're representing. Exactly, and that's and that's one of them. That's one of the things I like most about being an associate in that field. I mean, I've done every agreement, every commercial contract under the sun. SaaS agreements. I did celebrity endorsement deals, which are cool. I've done IP, you know, IP development deals. I've done supply agreements. I worked a lot with a, with a large fitness company, and I did a lot of their supply agreements. So they would buy the parts from, you know, suppliers overseas. Um, so I really became, you know, well versed in all these types of agreements. And even if I didn't start leave to start this, I definitely realized as a tech transactions lawyer, I was setting myself up for a strong career if I wanted to go in house or if I wanted to go to another firm, I was kind of really had a pretty broad, broad range of experience from that. Yeah. The, uh, the endorsement deals are always fun. I, I did a handful of those in my career and, and some of the asks, uh, that, that people have can, can get very interesting very quickly. Maybe we talk about that offline, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. So, um, so let's let's dig in more to uh, uh, Lateral Hub and Summer Associate Hub. Um, would love to understand where you came up with the idea and um, and just kind of take us through the, the the journey and the evolution from idea to company. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, happy to. So basically, what happened was uh, it was like a lot of other entrepreneurial stories. It just came from my own experience. I, I lateraled as a junior associate from one firm to the other in New York and went through that process and. Um, kind of realized that uh, it was, you know, how come this isn't done a better way? So basically, um, just to give a bit of, just to take a step back and give a bit of background, the main kind of the the lateral process for somebody who's moving from one big firm to the other, uh, it's really dominated by search firms or headhunters or third party, you know, sometimes it's called third party recruiters. And basically what that looks like is kind of as I uh, did some research and, and looked into it, um, basically the way it works is, Law firms, most almost all top law firms will post their openings on their website. So it's all public information. But at the same time, they'll also have a feed to dozens, sometimes even hundreds of third party recruiters. And those searches are not exclusive. Those third party recruiters are actually all fighting for the same roles and then all reaching out to the same candidates. Um, and then those candidates don't even know. The firm is hiring in order to keep kind of the to, to not get, give it away too much. A lot of the recruiters will say, "Oh, call me if you're interested. I'll tell you more about who's hiring," and they kind of hide the ball a little bit. So there's like there's two problems. One is, and then, oh, and then when when a recruiter um, submits a candidate to a firm and that firm hires that person, they pay the recruiter between usually between 25 and 35 percent of the base salary. So when I realized that and going through the process, I was like, well, like I was a second year associate and. The recruiter got paid like sixty thousand dollars to place me there. Right. This seems like a real mismatch. The firms are paying a lot of money for this when the when the when the postings are just on their website anyway. Um, so I thought there were two problems. One was an access to information problem, where as a lateral associate looking to make a move, there was no easy way to find out who's hiring unless you actually called a recruiter or did a, a t or spent a ton of time going website by website or um, doing something like that that's not efficient. And then there's another pain point, which is the firms are paying a lot of money. Uh, and if you're a firm that hires dozens of, of laterals a year, you're paying mil in the millions. Um, right. So basically, I thought to myself, well, how come? And I, I would always take phone calls with I built up a, a, a lot of knowledge and how to find a job as a lawyer, as a lawyer, both as a law student and a lateral. And I would always take phone calls from people in my network who wanted to get advice. And I really built up a little expertise in, in how to find a job um, as a lawyer. So I just thought to myself, like, how come every conversation ended with, well, let me see if they're hiring. Why don't you go find out if they're hiring? And I thought to myself, well, how come the top law firms don't just post their jobs in one place? Uh, yeah. And you know they wouldn't post on Indeed or some of them post on LinkedIn, but those are just too broad. They're too generic. It's off-brand. How come there isn't just a job board for top law firms? So I did a lot of research. I spoke to people. Um, spoke to uh, you know my first phone call was their lateral recruiting manager at my firm, and I said, "Hey, what do you what do you think of this idea?" And and the feedback was, "Yeah, it's a great idea. Here's what people have tried in the past. Here's why they didn't do it well. Um, here's some things to consider. You know, we hire X percent of of our laterals through search firms, and it's a big expense for us." And I was like, you know what, this is something that uh, that I should pursue. So I figured out, you know, did a lot of research, um, figured out how to develop the platform, got some really good detailed feedback about how, about what firms would want and decided, uh, like I said before, it kind of got to a point where I was like, I'm either doing it or I'm not. And right. that's that's basically what happened. And um, 
in the fall of 2022, I called a partner I worked for, uh, who I'm very close with, and I said, hey, listen, I, I have this, this this idea. I, I, I want to work on this. I'm pretty much, I'm going to work on this, but I want to figure out a way to stay at the firm for a little bit because I'm not ready to leave yet. Sure. And my firm actually, which is I pretty, think pretty unique, and, and um, most firms wouldn't do this, but they actually let me go part-time. Uh, so from January 2022 to May 2022, I was a part-time associate and then working on getting Lateral Hub started uh, with, my, with my other time. Uh, and I actually, I'll never forget, I took vacation from my firm to go to a conference for the week and start selling it and everything like that. And, uh, and then once we got to May 2022, uh, we decided to, to end that and I was working on Lateral Hub full time. And, and essentially the way, the way it went was, you know, classic two-sided marketplace. We were starting a job board. So we needed firms and we needed job seekers or candidates. So the entirety of the summer of 20, spring and summer of 2022, it was just how can, we had a demo version of the platform and said, how can we get enough firms on our platform to launch this thing, to open it up to job seekers? And that's, that's what I did, just selling cold emails, cold calling, conferences, connections. Um, and we, we got 18 firms to join for our launch. Uh, we had about 120 job postings. We launched it to the world on, in August of 2022. Um, my son was born three years later, so I like, three weeks later. So I like to say that uh, I had two babies. Um, <laughs> two babies were born. And... Um, and you know, fast forward two years later, we have about forty firms and two hundred job postings, and and uh, we're growing nicely. So that's that's essentially the story of Lateral Hub. So that's awesome that Fanwick was able to allow you to work part time. That is unique. Um, are are they customers now, or uh, yeah. one of your law firms? Is that Fanwick is that how you think customers both on both sides of the transaction? Is that how you refer to them, or? We usually call our firms a kind of member firms. That's the terminology okay. we came up with, which I think is good. And then we, you know, the candidates we call, you know, either job seekers, candidates, users. Um, sure. But it's it, the platform is totally free for job seekers. So, um, you know, check it out, lateralhub.com. Uh, you don't even need yeah. to make an account. So uh, we don't usually call it customers. It's just users, I guess, or candidates. Sure. But uh, but our firms are member firms. So Fenwick was one of our one of our inaugural member firms. Um, they've actually hired multiple people from the platform, which is which is uh, fantastic. I like to say that. They, they got the ROI. They lost me, but they got two more people uh, to replace yeah. me. So uh, they got the ROI there. That's awesome. That's very cool. So um, Summer Associate Hub. Yes. Seems like a pretty straightforward spinoff from it. How long before you actually launch that? And what are some of the differences that, uh, that you got there? Yeah, I skipped over that. So Summer Associate Hub was basically, it's actually slightly different from Lateral Hub. Uh, it's kind of a different model. So what happened was, and I won't go into too much detail here because there's so many layers to this, but essentially, um, you know, we started Lateral Hub and we would you know, have meetings with firms and talking about Lateral Hub. And what happened was the end of 2022, beginning of 2023, it happened where multiple, a few meetings in a row, people would say, Albert, this is uh, people, you know, directors of recruiting at firms would say, Albert, this is really, Ladder Hub is really great. But what are you doing to help us recruit law students? And, and I said, well, what about on campus interviewing or OCI? And, and uh, just to give a bit of background, what OCI is, uh, stands for on campus interviewing. Kind of at, at most of the law schools, especially the top law schools, they have a structured program where firms will come. Uh, what they call on campus, it's usually not on campus, it's at like some some offsite, and they'll interview, you know, tons of uh, hundreds of, of law students in, in the span of a couple of days. And the fir and the school organizes that and there's like a bidding process for students. And it's really for most students and most firms, you really just you do some networking, but you really just wait till OCI and then that's kind of your that's the prime time and you you, you know you whittle it down to the firms that you're able to get offers from. Something I didn't appreciate and something the firms basically turned us on to was OCI a lot more um, recruiting is happening outside of OCI. And there's some reasons for that which we want to get into here, but basically more and more firms are realizing, well, instead of waiting for OCI, we can get out to the students. Instead of waiting to OCI in July or August, we can get out to those students in May or June, urge them to apply to us directly. And now we have a whole pipeline of students. Then we can fill our class earlier, more efficiently, um, and, and do it that way. So once one firm does that, then another firm realizes, well, we can't wait around because now we're losing all of our candidates. And then they do it. And then so over the last two, three years, that basically completely snowballed. Every firms realized they couldn't just wait till OCI. Um, and then another thing that's kind of the perfect storm is that 2020, uh, obviously the COVID pandemic moved almost all of, of OCI virtual. So not yeah. only so not only were firms more eager to go out and hire candidates directly, but it was much easier to do that because they could interview candidates all around the country just by having them apply, apply to them directly and then interview them virtually. So basically, what we what the feedback we heard was. The process that we used to like, the structured process that we used to like, where our team would just wait until July or August and do OCI, that's all 
kind of blew up. And now our team is completely swamped. We're all trying to figure out how to get in front of students in our own way. We have to run our own interview process and it's become really chaotic. And if you could add structure to that process and, and help us engage with students earlier, um, that would be really valuable. So we basically were, like I said, small team is a fast team. We spun up Summer Associate Hub in the span of several weeks. And we basically created an entire content resource and content hub for law students for them to learn about practice areas, uh, to prepare for the recruiting process, to really give them the tools they need um, to then manage that process. And then because we're building up an audience of law students, we then, firms are then basically using us as an advertising opportunity. So we record video interviews with firms, we do live virtual programs um, with firms where they basically present to law students about different topics. Um, We have all different types of content, we have a newsletter, and then we're also planning an in-person job fair in New York uh, this summer on the pre-OCI timeline to basically give firms the ability to meet students in one place, similar to what they used to do before COVID. So yeah. not quite a job board, but a completely different type of model, but um, but a way for us to really try to meet some of the needs that, that firms seem to have. That's very cool. That's that's an awesome, awesome undertaking. That was always the difficult, difficult time trying to figure out what you're supposed to do for the summer. So yeah, it's very cool. Uh, so thinking about uh, thinking about some of the lessons learned now as you know, as founder and CEO, how does that change the way you think or would think about the practice of law and your approach to uh, your approach to that practice? Um, I mean, I think I think kind of similar to what I mentioned earlier, I think the practice of law is uh, I think you know, a lot of advice that that you hear from attorneys is, you know, don't just be a lawyer, be, be a business person, be, take, you know, think about things holistically. And I think being a founder uh, and, and working on this business only amplified that um, to really think holistically and look at it from a different perspective as opposed to just looking at the, at the, the, the legal side of things. Um, so that's, 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 definitely, uh, that's definitely part of it. Um, you know, but like I said, I mean, the practice of law, I think, I think a lot of people kind of view it as you know, oh, well, you got out or you escaped or trying to find the promised land. But I think for people who enjoy the practice of law, that's a perfectly great career. And, and I think um, just as long as people are thoughtful about what they want in their career and, and with their personal life, um, you know, I, I think a, I'm very I, I feel very fortunate that I was able to go to law school. And I think it's a really good career. Um, but it's, it's I think being intentional about what you want to do and maximizing your strengths is the key. So, I, you know, for me, leaving the practice of law, I'm still I'm still you know, barred, but leaving the practice of law formally to to work on this, I definitely feel like I'm maximizing a lot of skills, uh, you know, operation skills, marketing, writing, different types of things that maybe I wasn't doing as much as a lawyer. Um, but if somebody feels like another legal job would maximize their skills better, then they should definitely uh, pursue that. And I think that's always the goal. Yeah, there's an element for sure of like, I, I you know, I, I've gotten away a good bit from a lot of the substantive practice of law over the last few years, particularly as I've been able to build my team here at Lang Squares. But um, there are definitely days where, you know, where I think about it, I'm like, and I would just love to be sitting down doing commercial transactions. <laughs> like yeah. in many, in many ways, like life was so much simpler then, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and there's something therapeutic about it, for sure. It, you're right. It's, it's a great profession. I think that the legal discipline and, uh, you know, whether it's law firm or in-house, whatever path you're able to carve for yourself on that, like it is a great profession. And, um, you know, the entrepreneur path is definitely not for everybody going full into the business and sort of walking away from the substantive practice is not for everybody. But, um, you know, I think most lawyers at least have a part of them that miss that, that real practice. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. And so it sounds like you are always very entrepreneurial. You mentioned a t-shirt company, you mentioned delivering groceries. Do you think, I'm curious for your take on this, do you think that's just something you either you have or you don't, or where do you think it came from for you? Yeah. I mean, I don't think, I, I don't think it's you have it or you don't. I think, uh, you know, you talk with the entrepreneurial streak. I mean, maybe some, some folks uh, have it a little bit more naturally, but I think I think really it's about, it's about taking initiative. I think anybody who has who feels strongly about something or passionate about something, I think it's less about oh, you know, I'm not an entrepreneur or, or I can't do it. It's it's really just a matter of taking initiative and just doing it. Um, and I think one thing to keep in mind that I often tell people is, I think kind of the the archetype of of an entrepreneur is like some founder who's founded some VC backed company and you know is running this thing and all that, but 
most people who run businesses are actually running small businesses. I mean, we're not VC backed. Uh, you know, you look at our team, we're three people. Um, you know, we don't look like want some 100, you know, 100 person series C, you know, stage company. Um, and, uh, and I think most entrepreneurs, it's really just a matter of creating a small business in some way. And that could be, if you're passionate about a certain topic, it could be just creating content, maybe a newsletter mm -hmm. or just starting to write on LinkedIn or something about that. If you, uh, feel like you want to start something and, you know, there, there are even lawyers that I know who started businesses for consumer products or fashion and things like that. Um, and it really just a matter of them taking initiative. I don't think everybody has to, has to be born with like entrepreneur, entrepreneurship in their DNA. Um, it's just a matter of, of figuring out a way to do that. And, uh, and oftentimes it's really not that risky, um, especially as lawyers. Like when I decided to work on Lateral Hub, part of the analysis for me was, well, I'm a lawyer. I have good credentials. If this doesn't work out, I'll be fine. I could always mm -hmm. go back. The downside wasn't that big. The downside was really maybe a couple of years of not having the, you know, obviously there is a downside to not have like the big law pay for a couple of years. But, um, you know, uh, if, 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 you're, if you're confident in the idea, it's worth pursuing and then you could always go back. I think for, you know, being able to go part time, it was almost like kind of a side hustle for a few, for a few months. And then I was, I was much more confident taking that leap when I knew that it was going to work. And I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, it seems like they just kind of walked out of their office one day and did it. And that's usually not the case. It's they, it was a side hustle for them for a long time. And I think a lot of people can work that into their, to their career, um, just to take the initiative and start something. And then over time you could realize if it's something you want to pursue full time. That's great advice. Yeah. And do you have advice also for somebody that maybe is thinking about how am I going to start thinking about my day to day as more of a business person than a lawyer? Like how do I think about taking off that hat at the beginning? Yeah, I think it's just uh, yeah, I, I think it's just a matter of of uh, just taking a step back and 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 thinking about that. And um, you know, the, for me, for me, the the complete mindset shift. With, I don't know if it was automatic, um, but I think it comes naturally when you're passionate about something. Mm -hmm. It was a complete mindset shift for me. So I enjoyed what I was doing as a lawyer, but it's natural as a lawyer. You have whatever's on your to do list. Your clients, you have deliverables. You, you're in the client mm -hmm. service business. So I had what I had to do, got them done, got the markup out, got the agreement done, whatever that was. You know, you hope you don't have to work on the weekend. And then, uh, you know, you kind of you kind of back at it. Um, so a lot of the, the, the stress and anxiety that lawyers have is usually comes from, in my mind, comes from working like when you have to work a lot mm -hmm. um, and unpredictability. Uh, you know, not having control over your schedule. If you have a, if you have a certain client demand that needs to be done, which sometimes you have to just do it, you're in, you know, in the client service business. As a founder, the, the mindset completely shifted, and a lot of my anxiety, mm -hmm. and stress comes from not being, not doing enough, wanting to do more. Uh, you know, when the day is done, it's like oh, I wish I could have done all that stuff today. Versus like, oh, okay, well, I'm done. I'm done for the day. So mm -hmm. I think when you're passionate about something, I think that comes naturally. And I think that Alyssa, what you're asking about is, you know, how can you how, how can you switch into that mode? I think if you're working on something that you're passionate about, I think it comes naturally because you're mm -hmm. always going to want to be doing more uh, to 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 grow that as opposed to just thinking about the legal uh, legal side of it or if just trying to do whatever you have to do to, to be done for the day. That makes a lot of sense. That's a great answer. And also, you brought up something interesting. We talk a lot on Cockpit Council about work-life balance. Do you have any tips for work-life balance, especially when you're really passionate about what you're doing? Yeah, it's it's tough because like sometimes I feel like I'm even when I'm not working, I'm like thinking <laughs> thinking about it because it's, it's, uh, it's kind of my baby. But but I, you know, I could talk all day about, you know, I think work-life balance, I think is two things. It's one is, is, uh, actual productivity and time management to make sure that you're doing things in an efficient way that leaves you to have time for other things like time with your family or, or other interests that are outside of work, um, that keep you, that keep you focused and motivated. And, um, and then another part of it is just, is just prior, like prioritization. Um, so for time management, I'm, I'm kind of a junkie with that stuff. I could read and talk about time management all day. I don't always like practice what I preach, but but I think I've gone done a good job of it. One of my favorite books is um, it's called When by Daniel Pink, and he talks about how to structure your day kind of based on our natural you know tendencies uh, and, and where when we have the most energy to do certain different types of tasks. And I've structured my entire routine around that. So I'm definitely a morning person. I try to get up really early, sometimes around 5 a.m. Um, I'm able to exercise. I'm able to get some work done. And then this way, towards the end of the day, I don't feel so much pressure that I have to work in the evening or uh, or anything like that because I've gotten that those couple of hours in early, and it makes it easy to, to see my kids and to spend time with my family as opposed to feeling pressure at the end of the day. Um, and I'm able to allocate my tasks. And when I have meetings and when I have down to, uh, a solo time to work on on quiet work, I, I structure all of that around the time of day. Um, I think that's that on the efficiency and time management side. That's definitely something I try to do. 
And then priorities. I mean, it's just a matter of you know, it's easy to just work, work, work all the time when you're doing something like this and, and you know, put everything else in the back burner. One of the things that I was listening to the audiobook recently and really resonated was from The Seven Habits, uh, of course, a very famous book. And one of the, one of the things he talks about is um, when it comes to personal life, if you think about like a bank account and there's deposits and withdrawals and um, you know, when you spend time with family and you prioritize your family and personal life, you're making deposits. Now, saying that you're always going to prioritize those types of things is not realistic. Sometimes you need to work late. Sometimes you need to travel for work. Sometimes you need to, you need to make sacrifices. Those are withdrawals. And the key is the deposits have to be much more than the withdrawals. Because if you're withdrawing all the time and saying, oh, well, just I need this one time, I need this one time, I need to do this, this now, then your account's going to go broke. So you have to you have to keep making those deposits, and then when, and then when you need to make a withdrawal, it happens on occasion when it's important uh, for an important expense uh, versus uh, just constantly just constantly doing that. And that's something that really resonated with me, and and um, that's something I always try to try to keep in mind in terms of priorities. That's all very good advice. Thank you for sharing that. I can't take credit for it, but I'll repeat it from someone else. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we went. Did you have something to add? No. Okay. You can cut that. Um, so we end every episode with some rapid fire questions so we can dive into those. Um, what is your hot take on legal tech? Our business is probably not as squarely within legal tech as, as some other businesses, you know, that are, that are actually technology platforms helping with the practice of law. We're more, you know, I think we're more in the recruiting side and kind of tech enabled, but I will say I'm completely unqualified for this question, but I will say, um, my hot take on legal tech, just something just from observing, um, kind of from the sidelines is it seems like there's a lot of companies, um, especially with AI uh, and some, some feedback I got from Legal Week and things like that, a lot of companies doing doing the same thing. So I think my hot take is uh, I think there will be, um, I think the, the what we're doing with AI right now is going to survive. I think there's going to be a lot fewer companies doing it than, what ex than, than exist right now um, because it seems very, it, even though legal tech is a blooming area, it does definitely seem saturated in, in a few in a few subcategories. Um, so that's, you know, as much as everybody likes to say AI is the future, I think it is the future, but I think, I don't think it's the future for, um, I don't think it's sustainable to have dozens and dozens and dozens of companies within the legal space doing the same exact thing. That's interesting. I'm gonna ask another version of that question too. What is your hot take on work-life balance? Hot take on work-life balance. Uh, I don't know if this is the hot take. I feel like people are on both sides of the fence. I mean, one of the biggest, I think one of the biggest mistakes junior attorneys make right now is this whole focus on working remotely. I think if you're a junior attorney, you're coming out of law school or you're a first, second year associate, I think one of the biggest mistakes you can make is yelling and screaming about being, uh, being back in the office. I think you should find, instead of, instead of focusing on how you could work remotely, I think you should find a firm that you enjoy working in the office with your colleagues. Um, even though there's commuting time and you have to figure out how that works within your schedule, I think it's actually healthier for work-life balance because now your work and your life are a little more separated and and um, and it's clear the delineation between your work and your life. And then I also think it just makes you a better attorney and makes you enjoy your work more, which then makes you enjoy your life more because uh, because you're enjoying your work and it motivates you. That's a good answer. What's your number one tip for making career pivots? Career pivots, uh, this could be if you're moving from, even if it's moving from one law firm to the other, which isn't such a, a drastic pivot, it could be from moving from a law firm to in-house, it could be leaving a legal job, you know, that's something completely different like I did. I think the two things, two, new, two number one tips, they're tied. Um, number one is highlight your transferable skills. So if you're, if you're an attorney and you want to go work on the business side of a, of a large company, um, you know, don't just focus on because you worked at this top firm and you have the credentials, focus on the skills that you learned that are transferable to that role, um, both in your materials and in your interviews. And the other thing is doing your due diligence. I think a lot of people, um, they're like, oh, like, I'm just going to go in house. Like I'm done with this law firm. I'm just going to go in house. And then they go in house and they realize like they're just doing NDAs all day. Um, so I think, it, you know, you really have to just go a, a layer deeper. And even if it, and that also applies for when you leave the law. People like, oh, I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave a law firm. I'm going to like, I'm going to do this random thing. And then it's too, too quick of a decision sometimes. So I think when you're making a change like that, really do your due diligence, talk to people, understand what it's like. And this way, when you go into it, you know what you're getting yourself into. Great. What's the best advice that you've ever received or given for finding success? When we had our, our delivery business, uh, one of our, you know, one of our favorite clients who enjoyed working with us left us a note at, you know, at the end of the summer and said, you know, you, I'm really impressed with what you guys did. And she said, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And um, I, I don't know why that really 
It just uh, that always stuck in my mind. Um, and it really is true. Uh, I think how you do one thing is how you do everything. And I think in finding success, whatever you do, I think it's important to give it 100%. Um, that doesn't mean when you're out, that doesn't mean working all night, all the time and burning yourself out. That's that's 180%. I'm talking about giving your 100% in everything you do. So if you have a summer internship that you think is stupid and you don't want to do it, doesn't matter. You should give it your all, uh, make a good impression because no matter what you do, you want to make a good impression wherever you go. Um, number one, because you never know in life what's going to be important and who's going to be important. And you obviously want to make a good impression wherever you go, but also just for your, you owe it to yourself um, to be successful, whatever you decide to do in life, you want to, you want to, um, you want to do it the right way. Uh, and I think that's, so, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything because people are going to see how you act in one, in one, in one context and know that they could trust you in another context. So that was really important advice. And I always appreciated that. That's great nice. advice. So we always ask our, our guests, about a charity or a cause that's close to their heart that we could help amplify uh, to our listeners and through our network. Uh, is there anything top of mind for you? Yeah. So the, the can I can I give more than one? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Cool. So I think uh, you know as a hard to pinpoint one. I don't know that you know I don't know that it's particularly close to my heart, but I think I think these are a few important ones. I think one. As a lawyer, it's always interesting to see what types of, of charities come up in the legal space to help lawyers and, 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 and access to justice and things like that. So really interesting nonprofit um, that has come up in the last couple of years. It's called the Legal Accountability Project. Uh, it was started by a friend of mine named Eliza. I met her over the last couple of years. And basically, it's to add more. It's very in line with the mission we have at Lateral Hub. And it's basically to add more transparency to the clerkship process. Um, so I think a lot of people go into clerkships. They don't know that much about the judges. Um, you know, Obviously, some judges are wonderful. Some judges, uh, they could have a ne negative experience. So basically, what, what Legal Accountability Project started was a database where uh, clerks can anonymously uh, uh, fill out a survey about their experience at different courts. And this way, when a law student is, is considering a clerkship, they have more democratized information about what that experience is going to be like. Um, it, it, I think it's really important. And, um, and uh, I, I enjoy supporting, supporting Legal Accountability Project and with, our, with our audience. Another, uh, another important charity, uh, which is very well known as the Equal Justice Initiative, um, it's founded by uh, you know, Brian Stevenson, who's a very well-known activist and lawyer, um, basically representing um, representing candidates, uh, uh, representing inmates on death row in Alabama and other people who don't have access to justice. Um, they have a really, when I was at NYU, I think, I think Brian's still doing this. There was a, a clinic and a class that he taught and he actually had students that would actually spend half their time in Alabama during a semester representing people. A, a close friend of mine actually worked there for a few years and I always found it to be a fascinating, um, project and, Obviously, a famous book, Just Mercy, by Brian Stevenson, and it actually became a movie uh, with Michael B. Jordan. So definitely recommend checking that out. And then other, you know, other. There's so many different charities that I, you know, maybe will donate to um, with different different contexts. You know, I'm I'm an Orthodox Jew. Um, it's a big part of my identity, um, and uh, you know, especially everything going on in the world right now, uh, including on campus in the United States. You know, any organization yeah. that's actively fighting against anti-Semitism is important to me. Um, it's been definitely uh, a struggle to see what's happening. Um, you know, both kind of things that are happening at synagogues where people are, are uh, you know, anti-Semitic attacks and things like that, but also what's happening on campus uh, at, at various schools is, uh, is definitely very troubling. And um, I'm, I'm always uh, in support of organizations that are looking to, um, to uh, fight against hate. Awesome. Well, Albert, we'll be sure to amplify those causes. And um, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, sitting down with us today. It was great to, great to chat and great to get to know you a little bit. So really appreciate the time. Thanks for having me. This was this was a lot of fun. For those watching, listening, if you like this, give us a like, follow, subscribe on all the socials, and we will see you next time. Yeah.